Good morning, a warm welcome to our worship service this morning. Coming up, uh, Jonathan Thomas, pastor of Cornerstone Evangelical Church in Abergavenny, is going to uh, preach to us uh, from John chapter 21. But before we get there, we are going to share in some songs. And before then, let me uh, lead us into our worship by reading something from Exodus chapter 20. I'm sure you recall that Exodus chapter 20 is the record of when um, God speaks to his people on the foothills of Mount Sinai. There he gives them the Ten Commandments. And afterwards, in the narrative, we hear these words that the Lord said to Moses. It says to them, in every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. What an encouragement, what a great promise that the Lord God gave to his people. A promise that is still in operation today. Over the past few months, even though we've not been able to gather with um, our fellow Christians in the way that we usually do, I hope and pray that you have still uh, been experiencing the promise and presence of God and blessing of God in your home as you've been gathering around your screen to uh, take part in this service, but also gathering around the Bible um, in your own uh, time. And I hope and pray that today will be uh, again an experience like that, where the Lord meets you where you are to bless you and to comfort you and to encourage you. With that in mind, let us turn to him in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks that in Jesus Christ, your promises, all of your good promises are true for us today and in this hour. We pray that as we go into uh, the worship and praise of your holy name, we might know in a, a closer way, in a more intimate way, uh, your presence in our hearts and in our minds by your word expanding what we know about him and the enjoyment uh, we have of him in his uh, graces. So our Father, we pray that you would be, uh, you would reveal yourself uh, to us in a greater measure today, and that you would lift us up to be uh, in that place where Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, is uh, by your Spirit. In his name we pray. Amen. Take my hands and 
God's story, Jesus. So part of God's story, actually the biggest part of God's story is about how he sent us a rescuer. And it goes like this. Way back in the beginning, God created a perfect world and he made it exactly the way he wanted. It was full of good things like oceans and mountains and giraffes and jellyfish. There was no sickness or sadness or death. And he made people, Adam and Eve, to live in his perfect world with him forever. People were God's favorite creation. In fact, he called everything he made good, but he called people very good. Then something awful happened. They disobeyed God. And then that's when all the wrong things in the world began. Now, even though people disobeyed God, he loves us more than anything. So God planned a rescue. One day, he would send his son to rescue his family from all the wrong things in the world. That way, we could be close to God again. God's family was so excited about this rescuer. They waited hundreds and hundreds of years. They thought the rescuer would be a mighty king or maybe a powerful warrior. Imagine their surprise when the rescuer was born as a little baby. It was Jesus. It wasn't what they had expected, but it was exactly what God had planned. Jesus was completely human, but also completely God. That means he was perfect and never did anything wrong. He ate and slept and had friends just like you and me, but he could also do incredible things that only God can do. And when he was all grown up, he was ready to show the whole world that he was God's son. When Jesus was an adult, he started traveling and doing miracles. A miracle is something amazing that can only happen with God's help. And Jesus did lots of miracles. He went to a party and turned water into wine. He fed 5,000 hungry people with just five loaves of bread and two fish. He calmed a raging storm by telling it to stop. He walked on water. He healed people everywhere he went. He made blind people see and paralyzed people walk. He touched the sick and made their diseases disappear. He even brought a dead man back to life. And he told people that he could do all of this because he was the son of God. Jesus didn't just heal people on the outside, he healed them on the inside too. He forgave their sins. That means they didn't have to be punished for their wrong choices. Instead, they could follow Jesus. Some people didn't like what Jesus was doing. They didn't believe he was the son of God. And even after all the miracles Jesus did, like healing the sick and making blind people see, they still didn't believe him. They actually wanted Jesus to die. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus had to suffer and die on a cross, even though he had never done anything wrong. When Jesus died on the cross, God's family was broken hearted. The rescuer was gone. They wondered how they would ever be close to God again. But then something incredible happened. Jesus didn't stay dead. He came back to life. He was alive. He is alive. This was God's plan all along. Jesus chose to take the punishment for our sins. He died on the cross so we don't have to. And now anyone can become a part of God's family if we choose to believe that Jesus rescued us. We get to be close to Jesus because he loves us. He loves us when other people don't. He loves us when we feel left out, alone, and hurt. He loves us even when we do wrong things. And this isn't just your ordinary, everyday kind of love. It's the strongest, most powerful, never ending, never changing, always and forever kind of love. 
that no matter what we do or where we go, he will always be with us. And that's the story of Jesus. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. God made a perfect world. People messed it up. God had a plan to rescue us. It was Jesus. He did miracles and healed people. He showed everyone that he's the son of God. He died for us, rose from the dead, and forgave our sins. He loves us and nothing will ever change that. And that's a really great part of God's story. I love facts. I can spend all evening uh, looking on Google and searching all kinds of facts or reading books of amazing facts. For example, let me share a few with you. Did you know that a rat can last longer without water than a camel? A rat can last longer than a camel without water. That's a bizarre fact, isn't it? Or what about a fact about how long humans can survive in very difficult circumstances? For example, um, what is the longest a human can survive in extreme circumstances? Well, uh, after the Haiti earthquake, it was 28 days. Um, but back in 2005, with the Pakistan earthquakes, um, people lasted 63 days and were still rescued. We've even had people uh, stuck in mines. For example, the Chinese, uh, the mine flood, uh, there were 115 men there who were caught underground for eight days. It's amazing how long people can survive in extreme situations, particularly underground. But you can't survive there forever, indefinitely. You've got to get out of being trapped. Now, I love those kind of amazing facts, but there are some other facts which amaze me all the more, and they're contained in the Gospel of John. But I want to look at the last chapter, and the last verse of the last chapter of John's Gospel says this. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. What a great ending to a book. Do you know what? I've just touched the surface. Jesus did so much more, there wouldn't be room in the entire world uh, to write down all that he did. You see, Jesus is amazing. I wonder what amazes you about Jesus. Perhaps what amazes you about Jesus is that the uncreated one, the Lord Jesus, is eternal. Or perhaps that the uncreated eternal one became a part of creation. Or maybe what amazes you is not that he just became a part of creation as a man, but he became a baby and one of us. Maybe it's the fact that when he was on this earth, he cared for the poor and he loved the marginalised. Or perhaps it was the fact that he was willing to go to the cross for you. Or the fact that he rose victorious on the third day and beat death for you. I wonder what is it that amazes you about Jesus? That could be a great thing to do this week, wouldn't it? To be phoning around each other, zooming, whatsapping people and saying, do you know what amazes me about Jesus? Well, one hymn writer put something about the amazing Jesus. He said this, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. I think my personal view is that the most amazing thing about Jesus is that he could love a sinner, a condemned man, unclean, like me. I think that is amazing, that Jesus would love me and that all that he did was for me. But I think as Christians and as non-Christians, we can struggle to believe this sometimes. Perhaps you're watching this at the moment and you struggle to believe that Jesus loves you. And even for the believer, there is the possibility of living in the mine shaft, in the mine shaft. That is down in the dark, depressed and suppressed and battered down. Sometimes as Christians, we can struggle from what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones called spiritual depression. We're down in the mine shaft, we're condemned and we're not sure if Jesus loves us. 
But then there's another experience of the Christian, which is on the mountain top. When you're up on top of the Sugarloaf, aren't we looking forward to that day when we can walk the Sugarloaf again freely? And you can look out and you can breathe the air and you can see the views and the vistas and realise, yes, Jesus loves me. For the believer, there is both the mine shaft and the mountain top. And if you've been a Christian long enough, you will know that we experience both. And so what I want to do this morning is lift you up on top of the Sugarloaf, lift you up on top of the Blorange, lift you up on the Skirid and show you a vision of Jesus from John chapter 21, which I hope that if you're in the mine shaft of condemnation at the moment, this will lift you to the mountain top of belief. And so I want to base it a little bit on that hymn. Um, I stand amazed and we'll sing the hymn at the end of the service. Um, and so my points will kind of refer to the hymn a bit. So here's my first point this evening. Oh, how marvellous. Oh, how marvellous. We see that in John chapter 21 and verses 1 to 14. In those first 14 verses, we see a marvellous, an unbelievable, an extraordinary Jesus. What is it about him that's extraordinary? What is it about it that is so marvellous? He is risen. He is risen. Verse 1, he comes and appears again to the disciples to show that this is no hallucination. I find it amazing in John 21 that the disciples have gone back to fishing. They've gone back to what they know. Jesus has died and even though he's risen from the dead, they've just gone back to what they know. There's a sense in which, you see, grief confuses us. And, and when we suffer from grief, we just want to go back to the familiar. That's why I think in Britain, one of the things we tend to do when someone dies is, is make a cup of tea. Make a cup of tea. I don't know um, so much around here, but back in West Wales, um, when someone passed away, uh, friends would go and stay in the house all the time. And their job was just to make tea and cake. That's what they did. It was something we did. It's familiar. And really, the disciples of Jesus do the familiar. They go back to fishing. And here they are out fishing. They've been fishing all night, if you remember, in the reading. That's the best time so that they can sell their fish fresh in the morning, but they don't catch anything. What a kick in the teeth. Jesus has died. He seems to have risen, but then he's disappeared again. And now they can't even catch fish. They can't even catch fish. But then, verse 4, early in the morning, something happens. Jesus stands on the shores. They don't realise it's Jesus. And he says to them, try on the other side. Try on the other side. You can imagine the fisherman. We've been doing this all night. Hey, fella, what do you think you know? We haven't caught anything. It's time to come in. What difference is the side of the boat going to make? But they do it anyway. And verse 11 comes and what happens? They have a catch of fish, an amazing catch of fish. Do you see how many? 153. And you've got to pause and note here, John makes a point of recording the number. 153 fish. Do you get it? You've got it, haven't you? You've seen it in the text, haven't you? 153. One, five, three. Do you get it? It's a big number. They caught a big catch of fish. There's nothing more to it than that. It's just showing, look how amazing Jesus is. Look how much you can catch if you're with Jesus. And so verse 7, Peter clicks. He gets it. He jumps into the water. Verse 8, the others follow. And verse 9, they have breakfast with him. There's Jesus on the beach with the burning coals making the fish. Chapter 21 is showing us that Jesus has really risen from the dead. He is physically real. He is making fish. He's going to eat with them. Isn't this marvellous? Jesus is alive. He is walking, appearing, commanding, cooking and eating. You see, in chapter 20, we saw that Jesus really had been killed, really had been buried and really had risen from the dead with an empty tomb and really had appeared to 500 people. And now... He's really real. He is really here. And this is marvellous. We need to realise how marvellous it is that Jesus has risen from the dead. This is really the ultimate thing that will take us from the mine shaft to the mountain top. When we realise that Jesus has beaten death, that Jesus is victorious, that he is the first fruits of all who trust in him. 
whenever we're down, if we remember the cross and resurrection of Jesus, it will lift us. It will lift us. You see, when we're down in the mine shaft, we don't want to try and focus on our own strength. Really, what we need to realise is, yes, we are inadequate, but there is one who is completely adequate. The Lord Jesus. He has done everything for us. So we have this marvellous saviour who is risen from the dead. We're reminded of that at the start of chapter 21. And then secondly, we get, oh, how wonderful. Oh, how wonderful. We get a wonderful saviour in verses 15 to 17. I want to pause on these verses here, 15 to 17, because these verses make us wonder. You see, when you go to the top of a mountain and you look out and you walk up there and you look out, you wonder, you look at the view, you take it all in. It is astonishing. And the view here is amazing. And it's a significant view. John is aware of what he's doing. The Lord Jesus is aware of what he's doing. So you see, uh, just as John verses uh, 1 to 9 in chapter 29 really have corresponded to Peter's original calling in Luke 5. Do you remember the way he calls him to leave the nets and come to him? So here now that calling is there again. I think John 21 verses 15 to 17 is corresponding to John 18 15 to 27. That is, Jesus is deliberately replaying aspects of Peter's life. He's kind of going back to those times and saying, remember them. And he's deliberately seeking out Peter. I think this is one of the most amazing things of John 21 for me, that Jesus deliberately seeks out Peter. He goes to Peter. He talks to Peter. He wants Peter. And when Jesus seeks out Peter, he does it for two reasons. The first reason he seeks out Peter is because he wants to point out his sin. He wants to point out his sin. We see that there in verse 15, where he says to him, Peter, do you really love me? Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, that's how I remember the verse, but that's not the verse, is it? That's how I remember it, but it's not the verse. Look back down at verse 15. Simon, son of John. Do you love me more than these? Now, Jesus is doing something very significant here. Jesus has already renamed Simon Peter. And Peter means the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church, the confession that Jesus makes. And what are we seeing here? Peter, the rock, as one commentator has said, has turned to quicksand. He's no longer the rock. He's just Simon. He's the quicksand. See, Peter knows that he's failed. Peter knows that he's fallen. Peter knows that he's denied. Peter knows that he's messed up. And Jesus wants to point that out. Now, some of you at this point are thinking, what? Why would Jesus point out sin? How is that a good thing? Actually, that's the best thing. In fact, he's reminding him of what Peter had already said. He says, look, do you love me more than these? Now, what is he talking about? Is he talking about the fish? Is he saying, do you love me more than this big catch? I don't think that's what he's saying. I think Jesus is pointing to the other ten disciples, saying, do you love me more than these? Do you remember what Peter had said in Matthew 26? Then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have said, I will rise and I will go ahead of you into Galilee, Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I never will disown you. But he had. Peter, do you love me more than these? Simon, the quicksand, not the rock. Do you love me as much as you said you did more than these? Peter thought he loved Jesus more than everyone. Jesus thought he was stronger than everyone. Jesus is pointing out to Peter, no, you're not stronger. No, you don't love me more. He's pointing out his sin. Is that cruel? No, that is loving. That is loving. I want to think a little bit here about the Puritans and how they view this, because I think this is really helpful for us. You see, the Puritans believed, as, as one Puritan said, till sin is bitter, 
grace will not be sweet. Till sin is bitter, grace or Christ will not be sweet. Until we understand how sinful we need we are, we won't realise how gracious God is. So let me talk about a couple of books I love by the Puritans. The first one is called The Bruised Read by Richard Sibbs. The Bruised Read by Richard Sibbs. And he says this, we need to be bruised by our sin. We need to understand our sin. And this is what Richard Sibbs says. We have this for a foundation truth, that there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. It's better to go bruised to heaven than sound to hell. We need to realise our sin because that's when we realise how amazing Christ is. Or what about uh, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices by Thomas Brooks, another great uh, Puritan paperback. He says that actually one of Satan's tactics is to only show us our sin. Now that is cruel, to only show us our sin. So he says uh, in a section called Satan's Devices to Keep Saints in a Sad, Doubting, Questioning and Uncomfortable Condition. He says device number one, by causing them to be still pouring and musing upon sin, to mind their sins more than their saviour. When you look at your sin at the exclusivity and at the expense of the saviour that is dangerous but when you look at your sin in order to see the saviour now that is balm to the soul so listen to what thomas brooks goes on to say there is no condemnation to those who are in christ jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit that's what romans 8 1 says the law cannot condemn a believer, for Christ has fulfilled it for them. Divine justice cannot condemn him, for that Christ is satisfied. His sins cannot condemn him, for they in the blood of Christ are pardoned, and his own conscience upon righteous grounds cannot condemn him, because Christ, that is greater than his conscience, has acquitted him. Thomas Brooks and the Puritans believe this. Look to Christ when you look to your sin. And your sin will show you how much Christ loves you. Christ is showing Peter his sin, not to be cruel, but to be kind. So that he can show him his tender mercy and grace and love. That's when he can apply the balm of grace. Sometimes when we're in the mine shaft, we need, we need to go through conviction first. We need to realise that we're a sinner, condemned and clean. And that's when we see that we're loved. I love the fact that Jesus looks for Peter. In fact, if you go over to Mark's Gospel, it says that the risen Christ sends for the disciples and Peter. It's an odd thing to say because Peter is one of the disciples. But what it's saying is, is he had a special word for Peter. Why? Because Peter had denied him in a special way denied him in a special way some of us have what i want to call a truncheon theology a truncheon theology of god and we feel that if we do wrong god is just there to whack us or disown us we need to get rid of that truncheon theology we need to have a grace theology that realizes when jesus points out our sin he's doing it in order for us to come to him and cling to him so that the bitterness of the sin would point us to the Saviour and we would see the balm and the sweetness of our beautiful Saviour. Think about how God is revealed in the Bible. How does God reveal himself? In what picture language? Husband, shepherd, brother, lamb, hen. What are they all? They're all caring roles. They're all loving roles. How do we know Jesus cares? How do we know Jesus loves? 1 Peter 2 says this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you like sheep were going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. By seeing that Jesus has died for us, that's how we know he loves us. And that's what we need to see. The Puritans go further, and Richard Sibbs in particular goes further with this, and I find this so, so helpful for my soul. Richard Sibbs says, look, if God is so caring and so loving and so merciful, then he says there is a sense, listen to what Richard Sibbs says, as a mother is tenderest to the most diseased and weakest child, so does Christ most mercifully incline himself 
to the weakest. Can you believe that? I think we believe God inclines himself to the strongest. But what happens if Sibs is right? The Christ inclines himself to the weakest. If you're in the mine shaft today, if you're feeling weak today, if you know you fail today, Christ inclines himself to you. The husband, the shepherd, the brother, the lamb, the hen comes to you. What a wonderful thing. In John chapter 21, Jesus looks for Peter and he reminds Peter of his sin so that then Peter can be reminded of grace. We need to understand this. There is a humility that comes in conviction of sin that is vital. Listen to Isaiah. This is the one I esteem, I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Jesus says this, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Jesus quoting Isaiah says, a bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. If you come to Jesus in your sin and convicted of your sin, in the bitterness of your sin, he will forgive you and apply the balm of grace and it will be sweet. What is Jesus doing? Yes, he's pointing out Peter's sin, but he's also recommissioning Peter. He's recommissioning Peter. He's not saying to Peter, you failed me, so you're on the scrap heap. No, he says, Peter, you have failed me, and here is grace. Now I'm going to recommission you. Feed my sheep. I think the best Bible teachers, the best pastors, the best elders are ones who have failed a known weakness. When you know weakness, when you know forgiveness, it makes you more gracious and it makes you trust in the Lord Jesus more. Perhaps you're a little bit like the disciples and Peter at the moment. You failed Christ and so you've just given up and gone fishing. You failed Christ and so you've given up the front line and you've just gone back to something that is easier. Don't let Satan disqualify you. Don't let him keep you in your sin. Look to your sin and then see your saviour who is standing there, who wants to recommission you. So what happens to Peter? Well, it's amazing, isn't it? He sees Jesus, Jesus reminds him of his sin. Jesus then recommissions, says, go on, Peter, feed my sheep and what happens now well peter now lives a victorious christian life where he never messes up again doesn't he no 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 he doesn't you see finally we see thirdly let's take another line from the hymn my song shall ever be my song shall ever be this is from verses 18 to 23 we need to realize that in the christian life grace must be our song it must be our constant song the soundtrack to our life we need to learn to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. And Jesus at the end of this chapter really applies two reasons why we'll need grace every day. Verse 18, he says it's because we will grow old. We will grow old. Uh, John Stott in his last ever book called The Radical Disciple, which he wrote at the age of 88. He writes it after he'd lost the ability to care for himself um, anymore. And this is what he says about this verse. John tells us that Jesus' words had a specific reference to Peter and his death, but they embody a principle of wider application to growing old. That is, we need to be careful how we grow old. I think I used to believe as a young Christian that the older I became, the easier faith would be. I genuinely believed, really, as a teenager, that, look, all the temptations I've got now, they'll be gone as I'm old. That the older the, I get, the more boring I'll be, the more sanctified I'll be, and the easier it will be to, to kind of live the Christian life. I've learned that that is rubbish. I've learned that that is rubbish. Or oh, some of my temptations have changed, but temptations are still there. Or oh, some of my sins are now more respectable, but they're sins all the same. And it seems to me, reading John Stott's book and also reading a book by Billy Graham called Nearing Home about growing old, 
Growing old is a very difficult time for the Christian. It's so important not to just retire from Christian service. It's so important not just to become bitter about things that have happened to you or not happened to you. It's so difficult not just to become grumpy and grumble about everything else. We need to be able to grow old well. We need grace. But as well, Jesus says, another reason we need grace is persecution. Verse 19 talks about the death that they're going to face. Again, we need grace because people will attack our faith. For some of us, that's even within our, our own homes, within our own families, within our own friendship groups, within our own workplace, on our social media feed. We need grace, grace to keep going. Peter will need grace. Peter, we read in the book of Acts, will face all manner of things and at times will fall and people like Peter will have to come and really speak into his life to get him out of it. But he needs to learn that when he falls, to see a sin and to stand up in Christ again. That's what we need to do. It needs to be the soundtrack to our life, our constant theme of grace. So, how do you do it? How do you do it? Well, I think the way you keep going in the Christian life is to be amazed by Jesus. Verses 24 and 25, it's the end of the gospel. What should you do? Fill your life with Christ. Look to Christ. Read his word. Meditate on him. Say each and every day, Lord, we would see Jesus and see him. And as he fills your gaze and as he fills your mind and as he fills your heart and as the spirit shines a light on him and sheds his love into your heart, you will grow, you will see grace and you will go on. You will go on. As we come to the end of John's gospel, this is what I would say. Don't move on. Go deeper into Christ. That is moving on, is going deeper into Christ. See more of him, love him more, and he will take you from the mine shaft and lift you to the mountain tops, and you will fall to the mine shaft again, and he will raise you to the mountain tops. And the more we see Jesus, the more we will have that vista and view of the beauty of Christ and who we are in him. Amen.